Welcome to Hands on Health, the podcast all about living your healthiest life on the coast. I'm your host, Felicia Struve. I'm joined by Jeanette Johnson, who is a social worker with Lower Columbia Hospice. She works with people at the end of their lives and their families. This was a difficult episode for me to record. I first started talking with Jeanette about it several months ago. Then I lost someone very important to me. I wasn't sure I could make it through the recording without crying, but I did. And I think my recent loss gave me the perspective this topic needs. So, I hear you. Talking about death and grief is a bummer. You may feel like skipping this topic altogether, but guess what? We've all been grieving this year because we've all lost something that was important to us during the pandemic. Maybe you missed visiting family, date nights, or going to school. Perhaps you lost a job or a sense of financial stability. I keep hearing these types of things called little losses. But the thing is, when we don't take the time to acknowledge and feel the grief that comes with these losses, we can't accept them and move forward. We get stuck in grief in the same way that some people get stuck grieving when someone they love dies. Please join me for this episode of Hands on Health with Jeanette Johnson. I promise there's a silver lining. Hi, Jeanette. Welcome. Hi, Felicia. So you and I have been talking for a couple of weeks about this podcast, and it it came at a rather interesting time in my life because I lost somebody um, recently. And your role is with hospice and, you know, clearly people who who have loved ones in hospice or who are in hospice themselves and facing the end of their life deal with a lot of grief so we are today we're talking about grief and it's it's one of those sort of raw subjects that I think most people have or if they haven't Mm -hmm. experienced a lot of grief they will someday yes and I think we've been dealing with grief this whole last year and this is about that anniversary time Mm -hmm. of when a lot of our maybe grieving just as a country, grieving as a facility overall, when this all started last year. Yeah. Well, so tell me about, I I mean, I know that a lot of people in my circle went through periods of anger and frustration and and just deep sadness over the change in our lives over the last year. Right, right. What did you see? What, what did you experience personally? What were your pain points and, and points of grief in the last year with the changes in our society? Well, I think one of the things that, well, not only came up for me personally, but um, I would hear overall with either families I dealt with or with staff members, it was this sense that the things in our lives that have value and meaning, some of those things were just abruptly pulled out from under us. Um, mm-hmm. Our connections with people. Um, I, I remember going into the homes in that very first period of time. And, you know, we were kind of told to sort of you know, infection control and, you know, we don't want to really touch a whole, you know, and so things like even reaching out and, and uh, shaking a hand or uh, people who sometimes we would just give a hug or they would hug us. And it was like this distance. And it was like, even doing our job was just really different. And we all had to adjust to just things that you know, seem to bring value and meaning even to other people in their homes, we were having to do things differently. And Mm -hmm. the masks being a barrier as well. So it was very, very difficult just to make that transition to completely doing our jobs differently. Mm -hmm. Well, I imagine the masks also created... uh a large communication barrier for expressing empathy for, I mean, not just understanding words, but understanding emotion and meaning and sharing yourself with others. Yeah. And also just even so many of our patients and family members are hard of hearing. They can't see, read our lips. 
we have some clear masks now, but initially it was like, okay, how do we do this? And then we were wearing the shields, but then we were so fogged up that they couldn't read our lips anyways. So I don't, mm-hmm. It was just very, very difficult to um, just uh, do some things differently. And we had to really think through that process. And I think just overall in our personal lives over the last year too, the things that we found meaning in and value, uh, some of those things had to be done differently Mm-hmm. which um, I think that was a loss for all of us in one way or another. Some people maybe um, handled that differently, but um, but I think there was losses for all of us in one way or another. And it, it just was a, something that we had to adjust to. Mm-hmm. Well, you talk about um, adjusting. So you mentioned at one point, in previous conversations that grief is not something to fix. Right. Can you tell me more about that? Grief is not a problem to be solved, but it's basically a process. And when we think of where we've all been in the last year, I think we can all see how we've processed through a lot of different losses and how we do things differently. Um, it, you know, grew when we're talking about grief and in our grief groups and different things, we do talk a lot about how we grieve cognitively, how we process things, our perspective, as well as emotionally with our emotions. Um, socially, I think we had to deal with things differently in our social lives. That was all changed. Um, and then I think a lot of physical issues came from just how we were dealing with the last year. I think there was a lot of people who could have physical responses to this change of how we do things and how we do things differently. Hmm. In what way? What did you notice? Well, like people with headaches, um, Mm. just feeling completely tired out and fatigued, and you could just see the wear and tear that this was yeah. having on people physically and grief impacts us that way is that there's so many parts of our life that it touches on. And yeah. it, it really is an overall whole impact. So uh, one, of, one of the questions that I have, because for, for me, um, when I, I mean, it's different when I'm grieving for uh, somebody who's died versus uh, grieving, you know, a lost dream, for example. Right, there, there's right. differences in how I process right. these types of losses. But I often find myself compartmentalizing. Mm-hmm. So um, I, don't, I don't think I'm grieving, but then all of a sudden I realize that I'm just tired or I'm just blue what is what are some ways that we can recognize grief in ourselves and and maybe in our loved ones i think it's sometimes when like you said you you try to compartmentalize or sometimes even in this last year if we weren't really recognizing our losses we just have these moments where we get really foggy it's like you know oh man i forgot to do that you know, mm-hmm. all of a sudden our brain goes out the window and um, just maybe feeling that little bit out of sorts or distracted or there's just so many ways that that can come out in our lives that are so subtle that you don't just go, oh, man, I'm grieving. But you you go, oh, I, why do I just feel a little out of sorts? And everybody is just really irritating me today. You know, I just yeah, the irritation that's definitely yeah. a sign for me, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes then you just feel like, oh, I just wish I could just go out and just scream for a little bit, or you know, those kinds of things that we all feel like, you know, or or you just feel like you just need that little break away, and mm-hmm. um, you know, the, I, again, it can be those really subtle ways that grief can come out. And especially when we're doing our job, we're going to work every day, we're still continuing to do some of those things that we've always done, 
but mm-hmm. there's this this real underlying overwhelmed feeling at some point when you just feel like you know that last nerve has just been struck right and- well you know one of the things that uh i recognized with uh somebody close to me was that her way of coping with any frustrations of life in general was to take a vacation or to fantasize about running Mm -hmm. away, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, COVID took that away. We weren't traveling. We weren't able to run away. Yeah. And, and I think that was one of the, her, her struggle was really over, her release, her valve for being overwhelmed wasn't there anymore. And mm-hmm. and she really grieved that. Yeah. A lot of us who all of a sudden, um, well, I had a trip planned um, to Europe. And I, you know, it was one of those things that, it, you know, it was going to be kind of a once in a lifetime thing. And all of a sudden it was gone not because of anything we had done, you know, Um, it's like, you no longer have a reservation, uh, you know, and that was a hard email to get. We put that off for a long time of, you know, well, nobody's canceled us yet, even though we kind of knew we weren't going. But when the email came that you've just been canceled, (laughs) it's, it's one of those things that then you grieve. You just, you kind of go, oh, okay, we knew that was coming, but here it is, reality. Yeah. And, yeah, it's just one of those things that, again, you do it, then you move on, but then two weeks later, you kind of go, you know, I'm kind of irritated that this whole thing is (laughs) going on. Yeah. Well, you know, I can see myself in a situation like that saying, oh, well, it's, not that important. Other people have bigger problems and, and yeah. shoving it down. Yeah. And, and I think that probably plays into that recurrence of the grief, yeah. the frustration, yeah. the irritation. If you haven't processed it initially, if you just. You get overwhelmed. Yeah. 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 And then, you, then it's like, well, why am I upset about this and this and this and this? Because I really wanted that break. Right, right. And I think that's one of the things that I found myself doing with maybe other staff or people in my life that, you know, had these frustrations. And just being a social worker, it was like people would come in and you just have to listen. You know, Mm -hmm. you just have to be that listener and have a compassionate, understanding ear and just validate that, you know what? this is a tough time. And, you know, it it is, you're having some really natural, normal grief responses to what you've, what we've all been through. Um, But, you know, sometimes just having that timed event and to have a listening ear, that can kind of bring some outlet Mm -hmm. that maybe is needed that still doesn't get us to be able to go to Europe or (laughs) to our favorite spa or resort, but it is just having that listening ear. And I think the um, hospital offering that with a lot of the social workers as well, kind of recognize that sometimes people just need someplace to vent about, you know, what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, What can I do about this? Um, How can I keep my mental health in tact during right. a very difficult time when we are continuing to work. Well, I think that goes back to what you were saying about not being a problem to solve, but being a process it's because a process. That, that listening person isn't solving the problem. They're just helping you process, helping you speak, right? helping you get it out so you can let go of the frustrations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you but move maybe, on, move on to yeah. the next patient, <laughs> right. Right. or whatever we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, so if, as far as, um, uh, well, my example, um, I have children who are also grieving right now for mm-hmm. 
the loss of this person in our lives. And so, I, and I know this is, this is everybody this year is feeling their own grief and trying to support others through grief. How can we do that? How can we do that in a way that um, is helpful to them and not harmful to ourselves? What do we do? Well, and I think that is one of the things we just were talking about is being a good listener for those people in our lives. I think, like you said, with children, sometimes it's harder for them to maybe express the emotional piece of it, but giving them outlets to express that um, Mm -hmm. is really helpful, whether that be for them in a way that's creative or maybe they are very verbal and can talk about it, about their feelings, but just giving them opportunity to express um, in one way or another, whether, like I said, whether that's in a creative way um, or whether it is just listening. Well, now I'm, yeah, yeah. Now I'm thinking about, (laughs) I need to get some butcher paper and markers. (laughs) Maybe that's, maybe that's where we need to go with, with our conversation because yeah 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 i i mean i i think adults often mm-hmm. have problems figuring out what is that how how to express the emotion verbally right 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 so because our verbal side is a very um higher order thinking part of our brain and yet we're not experiencing Mm -hmm. those emotions at that level we're experiencing them in you know I've got an upset stomach or I'm not sleeping Mm -hmm. or I'm you know my heart rate is too fast or my I mean we experience it in a very physical way right right and I I, one of my favorite things is uh, you know years ago when I was doing grief support group um I used to do Every once in a while, uh, when I could see people were maybe attending group, getting a little bit stuck, I'd say, okay. And I'd bring out the paper and the markers and the color crayons and you name it. And I'd say, okay, we're going to sit here quietly for a while. And I want you just to draw your grief. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, they'd <laughs> complain and, oh, I haven't done that, you know. I mean, these are all adults, you know, and and they'd complain and finally they'd kind of settle in and go, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. You know, we don't want Jeanette to be upset because we're not cooperative. <laughs> and I tell you, they came up with some of the most powerful pictures I've ever seen. Um Everything from, you know, I remember one of them, it was like somebody was in jail and the whole Mm. picture had bars in front of it. It Just really, like you were saying, this deep gut kind of grief that was being expressed in these pictures. Um, And I, I tell you, when they you know, said what that was that were Mm -hmm. in these pictures. I, I I mean, I could hardly believe the depth of the emotion that they were willing to share in those situations. And um, yeah, that can be a really powerful exercise if, if you get people to do it, (laughs) if they're willing to put it all out there, Um, it can be very powerful. Well, and I, I, don't think we admit it to ourselves either. No, no. Well, and those were things that they were not expressing verbally in this group of Mm -hmm. people um, until they actually got in touch with it on paper and were able to express that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That's that, that give, gives me food for thought. Definitely. Um, All right. And you got me teary-eyed too, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that, that okay. was not my intention with this podcast. <laughs> no, I just I you know I started thinking um, somebody somebody in in the family who's going through this loss with me. Um, she said it's like part of her has died. You know, there's mm-hmm. this great big gaping hole and I and I'm I see it visually because that is such a visual um yes image to me and and so yeah 
it's mm -hmm. very interesting. Hey there, it's Felicia. Thanks for listening. I'd love to include your questions or comments in an upcoming episode. To leave me a message, please call 503-338-4654. If you've got a health question, I'll do my best to get you an expert answer. Again, that number is 503-338-4654. Now let's get back to our guest. But we all go through grief, right? We all grieve. And us. there's another, there, there's the other side. I mean, there's always this, and maybe it's cliche, but this idea that um, you will always grieve as long as you love that person or that mm -hmm. idea or that activity or whatever it is that you lost. Mm -hmm. um, you will always, as long as you love them, you will grieve. Yes. But it doesn't hurt as much. Like it becomes duller or it becomes, or people transform it. A lot of times, mm -hmm. like I've just seen people, people who've lost children, um, for example, turn to helping other children who might be in similar situations or have the disease or mm -hmm. what, what's the positive of grief? Well, I guess I always like to hang on to that piece of the hopefulness. Um, there's, um, I read an article and it, it talked about Lenox Hill Hospital in New York. And uh, during this period of COVID and the, uh, every time that a patient was released from the hospital or uh, they were taken off a uh, ventilator because they were breathing on their own, they started this song over the PA system of Here Comes the Sun. And I think most of us know that mm -hmm. song to some degree by the Beatles. And um, one of the couple of the lines in there are the smiles returning to the faces. I feel that ice is slowly melting. Mm -hmm. And I think when we're grieving and we talked about this process of grief, I think sometimes you start to feel like, okay, that's melting. It It's not going to be overnight. It's such a process. And people do that process differently and in different time frames. But I just think that, you know, even in that situation with the staff in those hospitals, mm -hmm. that brought a smile to their face when they thought, ah, somebody's being discharged from the hospital. Somebody's breathing on their own after that ventilator. And that Here Comes the Sun song brought that hopefulness, not only to the staff, but it was hopeful for those patients as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, the kind of the, the other side of that is that that song was composed by George Harrison when he was in a really down place in his life and he um, had skipped this meeting with accountants and, you know, all these other people, the, the business meeting and a lot of stressors at that time with the Beatles. And he had skipped that meeting and he'd gone to his best friend, Eric Clapton, and mm -hmm. he picked up a guitar and he walked in his garden and he composed Here Comes the Sun. Out hmm. of a deep, dark place, he composed this song with such hopefulness. And the lyrics, you know, the ice is melting, the, you know, things like that, that just bring that hopefulness to his situation. And at, at the recording time, apparently, um, John Lennon had just been in a car crash and he didn't, wasn't able to contribute to the song. But when the Beatles got together, that was one of the last songs that they recorded together was oh. Here Comes the Sun. Mm -hmm. And um, and when you think about it, you think about how much maybe even during this time of COVID at these hospitals, how much in that deep, dark place where George Harrison was at, how that has now impacted healthcare workers across the country in these Decades hospitals. Later. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So, well, I, I think that speaks directly to something that 
I've experienced when I'm grieving and when I am there in that place and allow myself to be in that place, it also feels very alive. And so the mm-hmm. laughter is greater. The joy that comes in those moments is greater, whether it's like a, a, a child's hug. Mm-hmm. Sweet. All of that is more poignant and deeper. So in some ways, when we go through grief, it's also a good time to reconnect to what is important to us. And I think at the beginning of COVID, that I heard that from a lot of people. Mm-hmm. They're hugging their children tighter. They, you know, they are cooking with their spouse. They're doing things that mm-hmm. forgot were so important that got yeah. lost. Yeah, yeah, and I th- yeah, and I think it. I I have to believe that I think this has changed us all <laughs> in mm-hmm. the way that uh, maybe we respond to things. Maybe the perspective we put on things, like you said, spending more time with the people that we really love and care about. Um, We've been forced to do it, um, but <laughs> but in a way, I think in some ways it also has changed some things that I do um, also that I find that are important. And um, so I think we'll all be changed. I you know we aren't on the other side of it yet, but <laughs> no, <laughs> we'll be all changed in one way or another. But I just think that there's such a hopefulness to. Um, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I heard over and over when they were interviewing people who were getting the COVID shot was, mm-hmm. oh, I just, I, you know, I'm just really excited to get this and, you know, move forward and all of that. And I heard so much hopefulness because, you know, I mean, last year we were thinking, oh, maybe by the end of August, oh, you know, we'll be able to, well, every, you know, we'd be disappointed over and over and over again. And I think with the vaccine now, I've heard so much hopefulness because at least maybe we can move some things forward. And I think Mm -hmm. in our grief, going through that process, I think there is that hopefulness. Mm -hmm. And I see it even with our patients in hospice in that a lot of times you go in and at the very beginning of our uh, time with hospice, you see people in such a place where I just can't hardly believe this is going to happen to my loved one. And, you know, it's like, uh, how can we slow this down? How can we, you know, do something different here? And just recently, over and over, I've heard, you know, I think they're ready to go. And I think I'm okay with it now Mm -hmm. um, because they're in a different place in their life that I don't want to see them continue to suffer. And they get to this place of, that there is going to be some hope even for their own life um, Mm -hmm. and some things they have planned to move forward. And so I see it with hospice patients and families. Families can see themselves moving forward. That doesn't mean that they're not going to grieve and still have that spot in their heart that aches, but they are moving forward with some hopefulness. Yeah. Now I I saw that in our family as well, mm-hmm. and and ours was quite com- compressed, um, basically between diagnosis and death. That was about two weeks, so wow. um, it was time. very fast. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I watched it in him. I watched it in the you know the rest of our family, and and by the end, it was this is this is the best way it can happen. Mm-hmm. That he, yeah, and to have time to have time to go through that process, I think is is a quite a quite a nice thing. I yeah, yeah, yeah. losing someone suddenly, I think, might be more difficult. It's so, a hard time. Yeah, doing that grief yeah. process. Yeah. Well, I I think you're absolutely right. The here comes the sun, right? And it feels yeah. like it right now. Spring is yeah. on Spring the, is spring upon is, us. <laughs> yes. So I think that between COVID and and uh, the weather, we're all feeling a little little more sunshiny. So 
So we can so we can wrap this up with a lot of hopefulness. Yes. For what is coming ahead. <laughs> because <laughs> something will come and we will cope yes. and we'll, yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time and talking through this with me today. Well, thanks for having me, Felicia. Well, I hope to have you again. So. Okay. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Felicia Struvi, and this has been an episode of Hands on Health, brought to you by Columbia Memorial Hospital.